Tier 1, Chapter 24. Are you dying? Oh, in this chapter, you're going to see Kate make a decision. Chapter 24 We wake early so that Eric can have some time with the boys before he has to fly out. Tal and Bentley are both surprised and elated to see their dad home. Eric wrestles with them while I make breakfast, and my heart is finally in a state of peace. I guess that's strange, considering all of the information I received last night, but it's so comforting to know. Nothing in my life was making sense. Now that all the pieces have clicked into place, I can at least start to deal with it. Thankfully, I have enough information to start processing the best options and outcomes. If only I could believe that none of the responsibility for these future decisions rested on me. To believe that my brain would, over time, calculate the best option based on my previous experience and wiring, and that action would be inevitable. I could passively watch that process occur and not worry about whether my action was right or wrong, better or worse. It would be the only action my mind and body could come to. Learning and progressing through a feedback loop. There wouldn't need to be any stress or regret. I continue whipping the eggs. It seems like a cop-out. We spend another hour together, then Eric has to leave. I hug him tightly, and I can tell he doesn't want to go. We all wave to him from the front porch, my newly validated self standing tall, watching his car drive away. Almost immediately, upon re-entering the house, my sensor dings. It's Nick, and I don't answer. How am I going to handle this? I can't say anything or let on that I know. I definitely don't want to give Eric any trouble. I have to act like nothing has changed, but I don't think I know what that would look like. Think. What space was I in before I saw Eric the other night? I probably would have answered Nick's call gratefully. I quickly call back after shooing the boys off to get dressed for the day. My assignments have been postponed this week. With all that was involved with preparing for the ceremony, the health center decided to lower my schedule. Initially, I was grateful, but now I am desperately in need of a distraction. Hey, Kate. How are you doing this morning? Nick says, answering the call. I can practically hear the grin on his face. I'm good. Eric just left to go back to headquarters, and the boys are getting dressed. How are you? I'm great, he pauses. I didn't see you again after we went back into the ballroom, so I just wanted to make sure everything was okay. Yes, sorry. Eric and I left right after that. We wanted to spend some time together before he had to leave again. I totally understand, Nick says a little too quickly. Is Bentley available to go play some ball this afternoon? I'm done with my shift at one o'clock, and I thought it would be a good time to hang out. We could play at the park across from your house so it doesn't require any extra time for you. That would be great. Just message when you are on your way, and we'll meet you there, I say. See you then, he signs off, and I lay my head in my hands. I have until one o'clock to figure out how ignorant Kate would act. All morning, I go through scenarios in my head. If Eric came back and didn't say anything, what would that night have been like? Probably frustrating. It probably would have ended up like the last few conversations we tried to have weeks ago. I try to engage him in conversation, he responds noncommittally. I try to remain calm but can't help a little annoyance creeping into my tone. He gets frustrated, I get upset, and we each go to bed not talking anymore. Okay, if that had happened, how would I be feeling? Alone. Scared. Angry. If alone, scared, and angry Kate went to the park to meet Nick, what would she be doing? Noticing him. Enjoying his companionship. Seeking validation that she is, in fact, not crazy. It is disturbingly easy to drop back into that space, but I go with it. Good enough. Nick should be here in about ten minutes, so I walk with the boys across to the park and push Bent on the swings while we wait. I suddenly realize I haven't talked with Sherry since the cafe. I should probably call her so she knows I am not upset. I don't have time for a full conversation now, so I send her a message just as I see Nick's car pull up. He doesn't get out right away, 
so eventually I walk over to the window and find him sleeping on the pull-down cot. I can't help but smile. He looks so young, almost boyish. He opens his eyes and I look away, embarrassed that I was staring at him. I step back as he opens the car door. I'm so sorry, I didn't think I would fall so deeply asleep. I guess I haven't fully recovered from last night. Nick yawns as he reaches into the trunk. His hair is wild and his movements are a little out of sorts. It's hard not to be amused watching him try to act normally. He pulls out three gloves and a baseball. I brought an extra for Tal. I didn't want him to feel left out. What about me? I feel left out now. I pretend to pout. Nick laughs. I did not think you would be into baseball. We can rotate in? I'm kidding. I'll throw a few, but then I actually have some files to catch up on from last week. I was planning to work on those while you guys play. Sounds good. He looks over to see the boys running our way. They have finally noticed he is here. We haven't checked out sports equipment in weeks. I think they are slightly excited, I laugh. Nick jogs over to them, and they start sorting out who will use which glove. I leave them to it and head over to set up my tablet at one of the benches. Working through my notes, I find it difficult to stay focused. My eyes keep straying to where Nick is playing with the boys. I am doing a pretty bang-up job of pretending to be ignorant Kate. Allowing my thoughts to stray, I wonder if I could actually be happy with Nick. Could I give up Eric and make a new life with him? What would happen with the boys? I assume they would stay with me. Eric would definitely be sacrificing the most. He would be alone with his research while I still had our family. I would be able to have more kids, and I have to admit this thought is tempting. Eric and I were maxed at three with our genetic matching. I glance around, irrationally nervous that someone would be able to sense my disloyalty for even entertaining the idea of this new life but I remind myself that I need to explore all the options. I owe it to myself and to Eric. I play out the different possibilities. Option one, Eric stays and gives up his involvement in the research. I don't even know what that means for our family. We obviously would not be keeping our commitment to put society above self. Would we be allowed to stay tier one? I have heard of people removing themselves and settling into tier two, could that be a possibility for us? Stay together but sacrifice tier one? What would that mean for our kids? They wouldn't have the resources they need to fulfill their potential. So we stay together but sacrifice our kids' future? That makes me feel sick. Maybe we stay together and move to tier two but leave the kids with new parents in tier one? More sick. Option two. Eric stays and somehow they allow us to remain Tier 1. They decide that our contributions to society are high enough that they won't require me to repair with Nick. Or maybe they find more pairs and it's not as necessary. Eric spends the rest of his life knowing that I am his selfish choice. Every day, he looks at me and feels worse about himself, becoming withdrawn and volatile over time. Maybe we stay together but maybe we split up because we can't handle the pain we are causing each other. Option three. Eric and I separate and I repair with Nick. We have children, quickly, because I'm getting old, and we do reversal therapy on Tal and Bentley so they don't feel the loss of their dad so acutely. Or maybe Eric is still involved? No, that would be too hard for me. Eric is not involved at all. The boys lose their dad, and I lose my other half. Literally. But I am not alone, and Nick and I would likely grow close. The kids have the resources they need. We start the process of fulfilling Eric's life's work. I miss him, but I am serving him every day by creating new potential for generations. Eric misses me, but he sees the good he has done. He repairs with someone else, most likely. He may even have more kids, too. We start over. We still love each other, just not together. I know Eric. He is so dedicated to this program and how it could change the course of humanity. He believes in this research 100%. He will not be able to just get over a choice that will make it more difficult for society to progress. My options are not to keep things the same or change. They have already changed. 
Eric and I won't ever be the same. This thought lands heavy on my heart. My fingers pause on the display, and I am lost in thought, remembering a time early in our pairing when we didn't have children yet. I woke up one morning feeling lazy and tired. I needed time to recharge, and I wanted Eric to recharge with me. I laugh thinking about needing more time for myself when I had multiple hours of discretionary time every day. That morning, though, I felt completely justified for wanting a break. I had been working hard and hadn't taken any time off all year. I rolled over to Eric and jokingly pouted, asking him to play hooky and stay home with me. I laid out a perfect day, with all of his favorite activities. He had research planned at the lab, and I remember being slightly offended that he wasn't even tempted to blow things off. I remember him, even then, saying that his research could change hundreds of lives. Our day of fun would only give us momentary pleasure and wouldn't even change anything for us, not really. Despite my protestations that this day could be life-changing, he didn't bend. I ended up going in for my shift that day, and it solidified what I had already known about Eric. He was always going to put others first. The potential to help society was always going to outweigh selfish desires for him, and it always has. The fact that he is struggling with this decision now shakes me. If Eric, the one person I have always counted on to be my compass, is tempted to choose us, I don't want to be the reason for his regret. I don't want him to go against his core beliefs. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. I type a quick message to Eric saying, I love you. Go save the world. I will do what I can to make sure your research moves forward. I hope it is cryptic enough, but that he understands what I mean. My heart starts to beat fast. Is this right? Am I really going to do this? I close my tablet before I can bring myself to press send. I should at least sleep on it. Placing my things to the side, I walk over to play some baseball.